بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى جميع إخوانه من النبيين والمرسلين وآل كل وصحب كل ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah raise the rank of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and protect his nation from that which he fears for them. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, let us first have the proper intention in our hearts to attend the lesson for the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Insha'Allah ta'ala tonight will be talking about the last chapter amongst the chapters of purification and starting from next week insha'Allah azza wa jal we'll be talking about the chapter of prayer we'll talk about the times of the prayers the dislike times and the integrals of the prayer the invalidators the conditions so we talk about requisites and prerequisites we talk about also the prayer of the traveler, how it is performed, the prayer of fee, the prayer for rain, the prayer for eclipse of the sun or the moon. We'll talk about all these and the funeral prayer as well. All these will be discussed, inshallah, explained in the chapter of prayer. But inshallah we'll talk tonight about the last chapter of the book of purification. The judge Abu Shuja' may Allah raise his rank in his book Al Ghaya wa Taqrib, which is a concise summary for the Islamic rules pertaining to purification, prayer, zakah, pilgrimage, fasting and the dealings as well according to the school of Imam Shafi'i may Allah raise his rank he said about this chapter the vaginal bleeding three types of blood exit from the vagina the blood of menstruation that of postpartum bleeding and bleeding due to sickness he then said menstrual blood is blood that normally exits from a woman's uh, vagina as a sign of having good health due to a regular cycle monthly cycle and without being caused by childbirth so when he said as a sign of having good health, he excluded the bleeding due to a sickness that has different rules. And when he said without being caused by childbirth, he excluded the postpartum bleeding, which has also its rules. So he's talking about the menstrual blood which is normally a regular thing that happens in a monthly cycle it's a sign of having good health he said it is usually black he means by this dark red in color and is pungent it could have different colors as well like the red and the light red as well the yellow all these colors are amongst the colors of the blood of menstruation so it's not a normal discharge it's a type of blood that exits on regular basis monthly basis and that's 
a sign of having a good health. So every month, a lady would see this bleeding for several days usually, and that's a sign of having a good health. Now the minimum, now we're going to talk about this not from medical perspective, rather from the rules pertaining to religion. Because there are rules that pertain to the menstrual bleeding which one has to learn. The scholars said the minimum for the menstrual bleeding is 24 hours. Keep that in mind. Any bleeding that is less than 24 hours cannot be classified as a menstruation, the menses. It has to be at least 24 hours. The maximum is 15 days. That means it cannot exceed 15 days. So 15 days is the maximum. Any bleeding within the 15 days is classified as menstruation. It could be 10 days, could be 15 days. Some ladies would experience the menstruation for 15 days. Then for the rest of the month, another 15 days purification. So it will be pure. So purity for 15 days and bleeding for 15 days. It could be for 10 days and the rest of the month is purity. It could be five days. It could be less, could be more. Now the minimum is 24 hours, the maximum is 15 days, and what is common amongst most women is to see the menstruation for about six or seven days, as the judge Abu Shuja mentioned. And we did mention that there is no hadith of the Prophet ﷺ stating that the minimum is like that, the maximum is like that, and there is what is common is like that. However, Imam Shafi'i uh, through asking women that surveys, you can say, he found out that that's the case. So the minimum is 24 hours, maximum 15 days, and what is most common is six or seven days. So when the lady is in her menstruation, she cannot pray, we're gonna talk about this. She cannot fast as well. How does she calculate the 24 hours, it could be continuous bleeding and it could be interrupted bleeding but the sum of the bleeding periods will add up to 24 hours. So if she sees the blood for six hours every day, so on the first day six hours, the following day another six hours, that's 12, then another six hours on the third day, that's 18, then on day four, another six hours, that adds up to 24. Once she calculates the amount of bleeding as making 24 hours, she knows that this is period, this is menstruation. That's the menstrual bleeding. If she prayed between the two bleeding intervals, that prayer is invalid. Although this is what she has to do in the first place. Meaning, if she has bleeding, let us say, from 6 o'clock in the morning up to 12 o'clock at noon time, 6 hours, then the bleeding stopped completely. What does she do in that case? She would clean herself, make wudu and pray, zuhur, asr, maghrib, isha. Then the following day, she bled for another 6 hours from 6 o'clock to 12. When that stops, she would also clean herself and pray for the rest of the day. Then the third day, then the fourth day. On the fourth day, when she completes 24 hour bleeding interval, that's when she needs to have the purificated bath in order to be allowed to pray. Now then on day five, on day six, any bleeding will affect her situation, so she would stop praying. And when she becomes clean, she would have purificated a bath and she would continue doing as such up to 15 days, which is the maximum period for menstruation. Now, if the bleeding continues until after 15 days, she knows that this is not 
while we talk about the menstrual blood that's blood due to sickness and that has its own rules so then after 15 days despite the bleeding she would be ordered to pray each prayer and for each prayer she would clean herself up perform wudu and pray so she would do this for each prayer that's uh, something specific for the bleeding due to sickness we said that the scholar said the minimum age for seeing the blood of menstruation is nine lunar years nine lunar years and the minimum period for purity which is between two menstrual intervals is 15 days that's the minimum and there is no maximum for it that's why the judge Abu Shuja mentioned here that the minimum duration of menstruation is a day and a night he means 24 hours its extent is 15 days the average cycle is normally six or seven days and the minimum duration for postpartum bleeding which comes after birth after she delivers the baby it could be for one moment that's the duration of the postpartum bleeding it could go up to 60 days what is most common is 40 days and we did mention that the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ummu Salama mentioned that a lady would stay in the state of postpartum bleeding for 40 days at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they used to experience the postpartum bleeding for 40 days and that's what is most common these days even up to 40 days it could last up to 60 and it could be for one moment and even the scholar said that in some cases there are some ladies some women who would uh, not see the postpartum bleeding at all they would give birth and after that they won't have any bleeding afterwards that could happen in some rare situations for some ladies so the minimum duration for postpartum bleeding is one moment its extent is 60 days and the average experience is normally 40 days the minimum purity between two menstrual periods is 15 days and it has no maximum limit meaning a lady could see the period once a year she could see it once in two years and she might see the period just once then afterwards she won't see the menstruation for the rest of her life this could happen as well that's why the scholar said that it has no maximum limit it has no maximum limit and they said that between two menstrual periods why because between postpartum bleeding and the menstrual bleeding it doesn't have to be 15 days so if she sees the postpartum bleeding for 60 days then she becomes pure for a couple of days then she sees the bleeding again and it goes up to 24 hours and more that will be classified as menstruation in that case now why do we learn about this because many women who are uneducated islamically about these matters once she sees the blood she might stop praying and fasting without knowing what type of bleeding that bleeding is so without knowing without learning she would just stop praying and sometimes when she becomes clean after let us say a couple of hours from bleeding she would not pray and she would wait till the following day without praying she can't do this and she can't say yeah because I know my normal habit would go up to six days now maybe this month has changed maybe this month is different that's why whenever the bleeding stops if it's before 24 hours she would clean herself up 
perform wudu and pray. If it's after a 24 hour bleeding interval, then she has to have the purificated bath and pray. She can't stop praying in that case. If she prayed between two in a non-bleeding interval, which is between two bleeding intervals, she prayed between them, then that prayer is invalid. If she fasts between these two bleeding intervals as well, the fasting is invalid. Let us say a lady became pure after five days and she had the purificated abbas and she started praying and fasting. That's what she has to do. Then on day 10, which is after five days, she saw the blood again for a couple of hours and it stopped, let us say. That means from day 1 till day 10, this whole period is classified as menstruation, including the non-bleeding interval. So if she uh, fasted day 7, 8, 9, for instance, that fasting is invalid. She has to make him up. And if she had prayed in that period of time, the prayer is invalid as well. That's why they have to learn about these matters as well. Then he mentioned about pregnancy and he said that the minimum duration for pregnancy is six months. The maximum duration is four years. And the most common duration is nine months. So up to these days, you might find uh, some ladies who would remain pregnant for six, seven, eight, nine, that's nine is most common months. Uh, up to four years, that could happen. In the past, the neighbor of Imam Malik radiallahu anhu, one of the righteous and trustworthy people called Muhammad ibn Ajlan, his wife gave birth to three children in 12 years. She carried each one of them for four years. So three kids in 12 years. That could happen, that's the maximum for it. Now inshallah ta'ala will talk about what is forbidden if one is in a state of minor ritual impurity, if one is in a state of janaba, that's a major ritual impurity due to sexual intercourse or the emission of the mani. And if the lady is in her menstruation period or the postpartum bleeding period. What is forbidden upon one in that case? The judge Abu Shuja mentioned that eight things are forbidden because of menstruation and postpartum bleeding. The prayer, the fasting, recitation of the Qur'an, touching and or carrying the book of the Qur'an, entering the mosque, circumambulation that is around the Kaaba, sexual intercourse and the enjoyment of what is between the navel and the knees. These eight matters are forbidden it due to menstruation and postpartum bleeding. Now regarding the prayer, as he mentioned, because the Prophet وسلم, said to a lady, when you have your period, you stop praying. And there is a scholarly consensus that the menstruating lady cannot pray. So when she is in that situation, and also, our lady Aisha, may Allah raise her rank, mentioned that at the time of the Prophet وسلم, whenever they used to have their period, then we used to be ordered to make up the missed days of fasting, and we never used to be ordered to make up the missed prayers. Now, why there is a difference between the prayers and fasting, because prayer is something that is performed every day. 
So if she were to be ordered to make up all the missed prayers, so imagine every month seven days, there will be a hardship for them. For that reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieved women from making up the missed prayers, but they are ordered to make up the missed days of fasting, as our lady Aisha radiallahu anha mentioned. So prayer, she cannot pray. Fasting, she cannot fast. Third, the recitation of the Quran. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, لا يقرأ الجنب ولا الحائض شيئا من القرآن Narrated by Abu Dawood and At-Tirmidhi. لا يقرأ الجنب ولا الحائض the menstruating lady and the one who is in a state of janaba. I'll repeat, when one is in a state of janaba, that means it's a major ritual impurity due to sexual intercourse or uh, the emission of the mani. In that case, one is classified as in a state of major ritual impurity. We call this janaba. So the Prophet wasallam said, لا يقرأ الجنب ولا الحائض شيئا من القرآن the one who is in a state of janaba and the menstruating lady should not read anything from the Quran. So with the intention of recitation, they cannot recite Quran. Now, however, there are some exemptions. There are some exemptions. The scholars mentioned about them. They said what she recites in the morning and in the evening for the purpose of seeking protection by some verses of the Qur'an such as Ayat Al-Kursi, Al-Falaq and Al-Nas, that's an exemption. That's an exemption. Also touching and or carrying the book of the Qur'an. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said لا يمسه إلا المطهرون meaning no one is allowed to touch the Mus'haf unless he is in a state of complete purification and that's when he has wudu and not in a state of major ritual impurity if touching is not allowed how about carrying so it, it has the same judgment so the lady that is menstruating or in the postpartum bleeding period is not allowed to carry the mushaf as well even if it's uh, put in a cover or bag she cannot carry it she cannot carry it when she is in that situation. And entering the mosque. So whether she's going to go into that mosque to sit down or to move from one place to another, keep moving, she's not allowed to do this. And this judgment applies to the one who is in a state of major ritual impurity, we call it janaba. And Allah mentioned that in the Quran. Allah Ta'ala said, Wala junuban illa abiri sabil hatta tagtasilu. So if one is in a state of major ritual impurity, he's not allowed to go and sit inside the mosque unless he's crossing inside the mosque to go to the other side. In some old mosques, especially in Lebanon, you find some of these mosques, a person would go from one door and exit from the other to take a shortcut to go to a different area. So because the mosque is huge, and they will take a shortcut through the mosque. So they enter from one door and they exit from the other door. That's called Abiri Sabil, crossing passerby they're not resting they're not sitting so that passerby who's going into that mosque from one door exiting from the other that is exempted that is allowed but for the one to be in the state of major ritual impurity janaba to sit inside the mosque that is forbidden as well as to keep moving from one place to another inside the mosque even without sitting that is not allowed as well so let us say he's 
uh, going inside the mosque, getting something, then moving from one place to another, as if he's working there, for instance, but he is in that state, he is not allowed to do so in that case. And uh, the scholars like Imam al Rafi'i and others said this judgment of entering the mosque and fearing that it would be contaminated with blood does not apply only to women when they are in the menstruation period or the postpartum bleeding period. They even said if someone suffers from incontinence of urine, the incontinence of urine that means continuous emission of urine. So such a person might contaminate the mosque. If he has that fear that he might contaminate the mosque, he's not allowed to go into the mosque in that case. If one secures that he won't contaminate the mosque, then he can go inside in that case. Also, circumambulation, which is around the Kaaba. That is as well forbidden for the menstruating lady and the lady in her postpartum bleeding period. And the proof for this is the hadith narrated by Al-Bukhari and Muslim that when Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had her period while being in the state of ihram so after she had the intention to be in the state of ihram for hajj she had her period so she asked the Prophet about what should she do in that case and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her do everything a pilgrim would do except for that you do not circumambulate the Kaaba. Meaning for the rest of the integrals of pilgrimage she is allowed to do. She doesn't have to be in the state of purity. For instance for Sa'i between Safa and Marwa for staying at Arafat at the land of Arafat for uh, staying at Muzdalifa, at Mina, for throwing the pebbles in the three basins in Mina, she can do that while not in a state of purity. The only thing from the integrals of Hajj and Umrah that necessitates the lady to be in a state of purity is circumambulating the Kaaba. Tawaf. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said At-tawaf bi manzilat as-salah ghayra anna allaha qad ahalla fihi al-mantiq Meaning the status of circumambulating the Kaaba is same as the status of prayer meaning same rules apply same rules apply except for that in Tawaf you are allowed to talk the normal talk while you converse with your uh, friends and relatives. So you can talk while you are making tawaf. So you can say to the one next to you, uh, what are you going to do after we finish, for instance. You can talk. But in the prayer you can't do that. But as for the rest of the conditions, they must be satisfied as well, same as in prayer. So the conditions that apply to the prayer, apply to the tawaf, circumambulating the Kaaba, except for the matter of talking, which is not a condition that one shouldn't talk while making tawaf around the Kaaba. But for the rest, for instance, one has to be in a state of complete purification. So he needs to have wudu. He needs to cover the awrah. As you do in prayer, you cover the awrah. You find many people while circumambulating the Kaaba, some of the prohibited nakedness, we call it the awrah, is uncovered. So if one wants to perform tawaf, he has to make sure that his tawaf is valid. Many ladies would not give concern regarding covering the neck from underneath the chin 
This here underneath the chin to the neck, that's part of the neck. This is a prohibited nakedness by consensus. So all the scholars said she must cover this here under the chin, this part here, top of the neck, that's part of the aura. It must be covered. So if a lady wants to circumambulate the Kaaba, she has to make sure that the prohibited nakedness is covered. So that's one of the conditions. So only for tawaf, out of all the integrals of Hajj, only for tawaf, the lady has to be in a state of purity. And she has to have wudu as well. If someone was circumambulating the Kaaba, let us say he made three rounds, then his wudu becomes invalidated. He can't continue the other four without wudu. He has to go perform wudu and come back. Now whether he needs to resume from the fourth round or to start from the beginning, the scholars held different sayings regarding this matter and this case. But one has to be uh, in a state of purity. So while having wudu. And the last thing, the sexual intercourse, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْمَحِيضِ قُلْ هُوَ أَذًا فَاعْتَزِلُ النِّسَاءَ فِي الْمَحِيضِ They ask you about the menstruation, tell them that there could be harm in it. So stay away from your wives when they are in the state of menstrual bleeding. It's haram by consensus for one to have intercourse with his wife while she is in the state of menstrual bleeding. It's haram by consensus. And Allah Ta'ala said, فَاعْتَزِلُ النِّسَاءَ فِي الْمَحِيلِ Meaning stay away from them when they are menstruating. Because that blood could cause harm. And that's why the scholars said, that type of bleeding is a sign of having a good health. It's a regular monthly cycle. So that bleeding every month, it cleans the womb for the woman. It cleans the womb for her. And that's how one would stay away from his wife during that period of time. It was mentioned that a person once had intercourse with his wife while she was menstruating. That's haram. And even the lady that is menstruating is not allowed to allow her husband to have intercourse with her while she's menstruating. But this happened, she got pregnant, then later on she gave birth to a child with dark skin. With dark skin. And uh, he started doubting because he's not of a dark skin and she's not of a dark skin as well. So he's becoming suspicious about his wife and he was about to accuse his wife of committing adultery. Then he was uh, depressed, he went to the mosque. As he entered the mosque there was a righteous Muslim giving a lesson righteous Muslim. When that righteous Muslim was giving the lesson and that person entered, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired this righteous Muslim with the problem that person is facing. Then that righteous Muslim, while teaching, suddenly he interrupted his lesson and he said, whoever has intercourse with his wife while she's menstruating, let him expect a child with dark skin. So he mentioned that Allah inspired him with what happened and that person remembered that this is what happened. So he retreated from accusing his wife with adultery. It's haram by consensus for one to have intercourse with his wife while she is menstruating. Now some scholars said to enjoy the area between the navel and the knee is allowed but the intercourse itself is forbidden. And that's by consensus, no talk about it. 
but uh, some scholars added that the whole area between the navel and the knee, one must stay away from it. Now, other than sexual intercourse, here yeah, some scholars said one is also not allowed to enjoy the area between the navel and the knees. And some scholars uh, remained on the saying that only sexual intercourse is forbidden. So regarding sexual intercourse, it is forbidden by consensus in that situation. And one would be classified as committing a major sin if he does so. And whether he has to pay an expiation for having sexual intercourse with his wife while in her menstruation period or not, the scholar said he should ask Allah for forgiveness, repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some said if he has intercourse with his wife at the beginning of the bleeding period, then he would donate, that's recommended, to donate a dinar. Dinar, you know that golden coin they used to deal with in the past, he would give it to poor people. And uh, if he has intercourse with his wife towards the end of it, he would also donate half of dinar. That's what they mention, but that's not compulsory. That's not an obligation. So that prohibition remains until the blood stops and she has the purificated bath after her. Before having the purificated bath, one is still not allowed to have intercourse with his wife. But for her, if she doesn't pray, let us say, she can fast before having the purificated bath. Uh, that means, for instance, let us say, just before dawn time, she became clean. She can intend to fast the following day. Then after dawn, by half an hour, let us say, she can do the purificatory bath to pray. But the fasting is valid. Now, the one who is in a state of janaba, we said this is a state of major ritual impurity due to having intercourse or the emission of money. Five matters are forbidden for such a person. First, as salah prayer, as we mentioned earlier. So the one who is in a state of major ritual impurity, he cannot pray. He cannot recite the Qur'an. And that's also not a matter of consensus amongst the scholars of Islam. According to Abdullah ibn Abbas, one can read the whole Quran, according to him, while in the state of Janaba. It's not a matter of consensus. Now, some scholars said, no, when one is in a state of Janaba, he cannot recite anything from the Quran. Except, as we mentioned, the verses that he would recite and some surahs of the Qur'an that he would recite for protection. For protection. Like uh, Ayat al-Kursi, al-Falaq, al-Nas. And the dhikr. Like for instance, uh, you know, it's recommended when riding a horse or camel to say, Subhana al-lazhi sakhara lana haza wa ma kunna lahu muqrineen wa inna ila rabbina lamun qalibun. That's sunnah to be said. But this is part of an ayah, or it's an ayah actually. That's part of an ayah. If one were to say it while in a state of janaba, he's not saying it with the intention of reciting the Qur'an, rather because it's a recommended zikr to be mentioned upon riding a camel or horse. So the intention is to do that recommended zikr and not to recite the Qur'an. As we mentioned, some scholars said one in a state of major ritual impurity, Janaba, is allowed to recite the Quran. That's according to some scholars. But here we're talking about a Shafi'i. He said prayer, reciting the Quran, touching and or carrying the Mus'haf. He's not allowed and he's in that state. The exemption is the hiras, you know, the hiras one would wear for protection as well. It could contain verses from the Qur'an. That hiras, you can still carry it 
put it around your neck even when one is in a state of major ritual impurity when the lady is in her menstruation period or postpartum bleeding period she can leave the head is on she doesn't have to take it off when she is in that situation and a tawaf circumambulating the Kaaba as well and staying in the mosque one cannot do this as well now the Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith إِنِّي لَا أُحِلُّ الْمَسْجِدَ لِحَائِضٍ وَلَا جُنُبٍ Now this hadith means I do not permit one to stay in the mosque if one is in the menstruation period that's pertaining to ladies or in a state of janaba. He is not allowed to stay in the mosque in that state. Now the one who is in a state of minor ritual impurity Meaning he is not in a state of major ritual impurity. And here we are referring to the one who doesn't have wudu. So before performing wudu, three matters are forbidden for such a person. Salah, which is a prayer. Tawaf, circumambulating the Kaaba. And touching and or carrying the Mus'haf. So these three matters are forbidden for the one who is in a state of minor ritual impurity. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا يقبل الله صلاة بغير طهور And that's in reference to any type of prayer, whether it is the five obligatory prayers, whether it is a recommended prayer, and whether it is the funeral prayer and any other prayer. And you know, the funeral prayer, it doesn't have ruku'a or sujood. But still one needs to have wudu in order to perform this type of prayer. So any type of prayer, you need to have wudu. For any type of prayer, you need to have wudu. So these are the three matters that one should stay away from if he doesn't have wudu. Prayer, he needs to make wudu in order to be allowed to pray. Tawaf, touching and carrying the mushaf. One has to have wudu as well. By the support of Allah Azza wa we have concluded talking about the whole chapter of purification from this book. Inshallah, starting from next week, we'll be talking about the chapter of prayer. And we'll start talking about the times of the prayers, inshallah, Azza wa Jal, and how Angel Jibreel, alayhi salam, taught the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the times for each prayer, inshallah, Azza wa Jal, and Allah knows best.